All right, hello. Um, we're going to go ahead and begin the webinar. Um, I think some of you who were waiting on the call previously uh, heard me the first time. I am Nasser Asif, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Outreach here at C3 Communications. Uh, thanks again uh, heartily to everyone for joining us today. We're, we're so happy that so many of you were able to make it to our webinar. Uh, before we get started, I uh, just really briefly want to thank our sponsor, the Avi Chai Foundation, for their generous support of the day school community and for providing this resource uh, to, to everyone on the call today. Uh, we sincerely hope that you all have the chance to take advantage of this and, and other resources as part of the Day School Video Academy program. I'd just like to remind everyone that we've created a, uh, a clearinghouse, really, for all the info that we've covered through the entire educational process, uh, from storytelling to production to, uh, to the distribution that we're going to discuss today. Uh, and this is at www.dayschoolvideoacademy.org. Where we can encourage, where we do encourage you to go and, and view this and other webinars and check out even more great resources that we've posted to uh, to ultimately help you guys make better videos. Uh, we also strongly encourage you to take advantage of the one-on-one -on -one consultations with C3 that are available for free as part of the program. And you can also find out how to schedule these consultations uh, with the experts on our team, uh, again, at www.dayschoolvideoacademy.org. Uh, it's a really great way to get a more personalized tutorial on how to create and distribute video from people who create and distribute video for a living and have been doing it for many years. So we certainly understand that some of you have unique needs and issues, and some of you just might need some hands-on help in, in getting started, and it's, that's exactly what these consultations, which are done via phone or email, are for. Uh, so we hope you get to... I, I actually hope. I get to schedule some time with most of you who are on the call today and, uh, and take a deeper dive into your video distribution and, and obviously our storytelling and production experts feel the same way. Um, before we, we get started and jump into uh, today's program, I want to uh, start with a couple of housekeeping notes. First, uh, right off the bat, we're going to send out a quick poll uh, to, to ask you guys just kind of a kickoff question. Um, we're going to do this a few times throughout the webinar, uh, so I encourage you to, uh, to take part in this. This is actually just a way for us to, uh, to get a better idea of everyone's capabilities and, and feelings around video and, and refine the program thusly. Um, we also encourage you to ask questions as we go. Um, to do that, just use the question function in your GoToWebinar software. I'll be pausing to field questions at a couple points throughout our presentation today, so, uh, so don't be shy. Just let us know what you want to know, and we will do our very best to get to it on our time today. Um, knowing that that time is limited, however, if we don't get a chance to get to your question, I'd remind you that we can cover them in detail through, uh, through a consultation over email or the phone. Um, also, if you're just having any trouble seeing the screen at all, you should be seeing the, uh, the title slide on distribution, the fourth and final webinar in our series. Um, if you're having any technical issues, just go ahead and use the question feature and we'll try to, try to help you troubleshoot. Um, okay, so finally, the recorded version of this webinar is going to be posted to the Day School Video Academy website, um, along with links to some, some great tutorials on how to use uh, a few of the actual tools that we're going to go ahead and cover right now. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and launch into it. Um, again, I encourage everyone to ask questions as we go, and we'll, we'll, we'll pause to answer those um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the presentation. But uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to pop right into it. So we're here today to discuss video distribution, and that's getting your video out in front of the people who need to see it. Um, you know, creating, creating video is definitely not an end in and of itself. It's, it's definitely the first step, but really the end run of this is actually getting eyes on impressions, uh, views from the people who matter to your organiza organization who need to see these videos and, and will be moved by the content and, and they will take action as a result. Uh, your market is generally local, we understand that, and you're producing video that pays off when the right target audience sees that. And smart distribution is how that you can ensure that your video efforts are focused on the right people, and you're, you're efficient in both creating your content and efficient in both making sure that, that the, the decision makers, the people who, who really need to see that, will do so. Uh, and so that's what we're going to disco discover today, is basically how you guys can get this video out using a, a number of different techniques and a number of different channels to, uh, to the right folks in your community. So let's get into our introduction to video distribution. Um, I, I like to think that it's both strategic and technical. In fact, I kind of think of it as an art and a science. Um, it takes some new and exciting learning at first, but in the end it's easy. It's like riding a bike. Once you figure out the basics, you'll be able to repeat this process uh, over and over again. Uh, it's sort of figuring out the theory behind distribution and mastering a couple of the tools really really makes you dangerous in terms of getting your content out there uh, and, and being kind of that, that cornerstone for, for distributing video in your organization. Um, 
the importance of it is that it gives you an, a larger overall online presence. And that presence is going to pay off by better search or, or SEO, search engine optimization. Uh, and that's just a fancy term for content that makes your school rank higher in search engines like Google against certain keywords and themes. Uh, and ultimately, it's how you get the story of your school in front of the people that, that really care. So let's talk about the tools a little bit, though. Um, obviously, you know, there's the strategy in getting your video out there, but there are actual tools and, and websites that we use to, to achieve this. Um, and I, I want to just kick things off by saying that these tools for distributing have really evolved and have provided uh, you know, local, the DIY staff at, at day schools um, are a real opportunity to benefit from, from some pretty sophisticated stuff. Um, just anecdotally, I can remember in 2006 when YouTube really kind of hit the market. And you know, frankly, back then it was kind of cheap and pretty shoddy. Uh, and that's not really the case anymore. Um, these new video distributions, um, YouTube among them, allow you to not only target your videos in a, in a pretty refined way and send them out all over the web, but they also let you track success and they let you find out how many views your videos got, the demographics, like the age and the gender, for example, of the people who watch them, uh, and the geography of where your viewers came from, which I know is very, very important for, uh, for everyone on the call who's really playing in a local market in terms of, you know, in terms of the, uh, the people they're trying to reach. Um, this picture here just, just demonstrates that you know, this is the, the back end, the, uh, the dashboard as we call it, in YouTube. And, and this is just an example of, uh, of how you can get some data on the, uh, like the, for example, the gender of, and the age of people who are watching your videos, as well as uh, the, the kind of, this is just the national level, but you can even drill this down a little bit to, um, to, to smaller locales to find out who is watching your stuff. And it's great because it helps you track the, uh, the impact of your video media in the end, and it gives you the insights into who's watching, and that lets you refine your content. Or, for example, compare two videos side by side, all things being equal, to inform your choices about your next one. You're going to see which video performed the best out of the pack, and you're going to be able to, to understand that some of the content in that video, the message, the style, uh, and, and whatever else was, was more successful. And so you can build on that insight to create better content going forward. So think of, think of video as kind of a lifelong iterative process. You're always getting better at it. And that's what's, uh, that's what's really exciting to us. And, and we hope you find that exciting too. Um, pretty much in short, you can now use these tools to learn from your existing content to refine your future content. And so we're going to cover four basic categories of distribution today. Um, really, we consider these channels um, similar to, to even a TV channel or, uh, or, or a newspaper or something like that, kind of what we call old media. And in terms of online media, um, we're going to cover YouTube, obviously, which, which I'm sure everyone has, has heard of and is the, you know, the largest video viewing site um, in the U.S. and really globally. Uh, we're going to talk about online social networks, social networks like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we're going to talk about bloggers and affiliates, so that's you know earned media, um, online media in your communities that, that you can leverage, uh, and then kind of the other video sites and how you can efficiently distribute video on those sites using uh, what we call video aggregators, um, especially one that's called Tube Mobile that we're going to talk about um, in, in depth a little bit later in the presentation. And I would note that um, all of these channels that we're covering are really, they have no specific cost. There's no, there's no subscription fee for anything that we're covering. The only real costs that any, anyone on this call will face from, from employing these methods is a little bit of time and learning to actually get up and running on using these. And we really, we really encourage that. Um, nothing here requires a big subscription fee or a huge, frankly, a huge amount of, uh, of, of effort either. It's all, it's all fairly simple and fairly turnkey for, for getting your videos, um, the, the views and the exposure that you want. Um, but first, I want to talk about search uh, before we get into the actual tactical stuff about video. And it's important for, for video because really search uh, and, and video is, is interrelated. Um, I don't know how many of you might have done a Google search this morning, for example, but chances are if you did, inside the top 10 rankings, the, the top 10 results you got on your Google search, you saw a video come up in that screen. Um, and that's because search actually indexes um, higher than a lot of other content. And, and that's really, or rather video searches or, or indexes higher than a lot of search content. Um, Google actually says that search terms uh, that are supported by video have a 53% higher probability of showing up in the top 10 searches, which is, which is pretty powerful stuff. Um, video drives 
search results, um, especially on Google, as I mentioned. Um, just anecdotally, uh, YouTube, for example, is the actually the number two search engine in the United States, and it's heavily tied into Google. Uh, the average user spends between 15 and 25 minutes on the on the YouTube site every single day. Um, but w I want to define actually search really quickly because uh, there are really two kinds when it comes to video. There's video search, which is people searching specifically for videos on networks like YouTube, for example. Or general, what I call on-page search, which is people searching for general content around a specific topic. Like, for example, um, people just looking around the general idea of back to school or Jewish learning. Uh, and, and those are more what we call long tail themes. We don't need to, to get into what that means, but basically broader concepts that can be communicated by video. So the key part of search is something called tagging. Um, and I, I want to really quickly talk about tagging. Um, it, it's basically just the way that you categorize your video content and basically tell the internet what your, what your video is all about. So that when search engines are, are crawling the internet to actually find um, relevant content for people's search results, you know, the, the terms that they, that, they dot, that they type into Google, uh, that's actually going to get picked up and actually get returned back on their, back on their search. And that's going to give you better results for, uh, for both video search inside of, inside of channels like YouTube and just online search overall. Uh, and like I said, tags are simply the terms that you assign to your video content that allow the internet uh, and search engines to categorize your content. Uh, simply put, tagging your, your back to school theme video for, for back to school, for example, will allow that video to be more easily found online for that subject. And so, for example, here in my screen, you can just see a, a set of tags around one particular video. And, and this is just basically the identifying, uh, identifying categories that actually show what the content is all about. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about what matters for search, really. Um, and, and these are kind of complex things. There's tons of search engine optimization agencies out there who, who get really deep into the, the nitty gritty and the esoterica of all this. But for, for everyone on the call's purposes today, and especially around video, um, there's really just a handful of things that, that truly matter in terms of video search uh, and, and video's effects on search. Uh, and I'm just going to tick down our list. Um, first is metadata. And metadata, it's, it's really just a, a $60 word for the terms and identifiers that are built into content and web pages that are not visible to the public on the internet. Um, these are, are terms that are either coded into files or included into web pages or content management systems, for example. Uh, and those allow search engines like Google to identify what the content on the page is all about. It's basically just, uh, it, it, it's the words on the t-shirt that, uh, that the website is wearing to, to let the internet know what kind of bands that it likes, uh, to, to use kind of a clumsy metaphor there. But um, to take advantage of this, you'll need to probably work with your web people in some instances, and in some cases you won't at all. Um, there, there are a couple ways to work around this, um, but more on that later. Uh, the next thing that really boosts search ratings for video is the number of comments and shares that video gets. It's the interactivity. Uh, for example, on YouTube, um, it's going to... A, 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 video is going to index higher in video search if more people are commenting on it and sharing it with their friends. Uh, the date you added the content is also relevant. I mean, obviously, there's a there, there's sort of a cycle um, of, of the internet overall of, of, you know, data comes in and data goes. And the date you add your video uh, is, is obviously key to that. Uh, and then, of course, the view count, the number of people who are, who are viewing your video. Um, this is especially important on YouTube because it really, it, it boosts your, your score if more people are watching it. It becomes more popular. It's trending and, and the YouTube algorithm, the, the, the math that YouTube uses to calculate up what's important when what's not um, is, is really based on view count by a large part. Uh, and then rating and flagging were applicable. This is really more for uh, video, video search sites, video viewing sites like YouTube or Vimeo, uh, which we'll talk about later. And then something called incoming links, um, which many of you might be familiar with. If not, incoming links is simply exposure on other sites and embedded videos. So, so for example, uh, videos that you've actually taken, let's say, off of YouTube and, uh, and had someone post on, let's say, blogs that are, that are friendly to your organization. Uh, when people click through those videos, that traffic that goes back to YouTube is going to boost that score. Or if that traffic goes back to, let's say, your website, that's going to boost, um, boost that page's score as well. 
So I think we're going to uh, to send out another poll real quick, and and I uh, encourage everyone again to uh, to participate in that kind of as we go. That'll give us a chance to uh, to see uh, what everyone's thinking and and how um, how everyone's been using some of these tools in the past. But while you're doing that, I'm going to continue on uh, to discuss tagging and and video search. Um, Targeting is really important in, in keyword structure and actually creating keywords that, that resonate and keywords that get picked up by search engines. Um, and that needs to be based on the content of your video. I know that sounds pretty, pretty simple and pretty intuitive, but it's actually something that a lot of people lose sight of after they create and post their content. Really, tagging is in a lot of ways where the rubber meets the road for making it what we call sticky or more likely to get picked up. And if you're, so for example, if your video is back to school themed, it's a back to school video, I'm just gonna pick on this topic uh, throughout the presentation, by the way. Um, use that key phrase in your tags. Uh, that's, that's very important. So I, uh, really quickly, I'm going to show everyone, for example, some tagged video that we have on our own YouTube channel. And that should give you an example of what some of these look like. Let's see, let me go actually go back to um, our original video. or even in this case, just do a public video. And as you can see, the tags here are Jewish, primary, day school of the nation's capital. Pretty, pretty straightforward, actually picks up sort of the essence of, of the title of the video, uh, which is important. So that's just an example. Um, one of the most important factors also for on-page search that we should consider, and that's videos that are hosted on your site, is that title tag. Uh, so if your keyword theme is back to school, put that in the actual title of the file itself, uh, and, and that's important as well. Um, I'm going to stop for a second, actually, to field a question or two. Um, so let's see what we have here. Um, someone asked, I heard there's a way to pay to get your content, video, and text to come up first on searches, uh, and how does that work? Uh, that's a great question, uh, and that is actually quite true. Uh, video has something called, or rather, YouTube has something called sponsored video. Uh, sponsored video is basically an ad technique that actually lets you pay to, to increase your searches based on, uh, based on search results. It's fairly, fairly simple to use. Um, you're, you're basically sponsoring terms, so you're, you're paying for specific keywords to boost the, the chance of your video showing up. Uh, and that is, uh, if people see sort of a, um, a sort of highlighted video in the upper right hand corner of a, of a YouTube search, um, pretty much any time you're searching for anything on YouTube, like a music video for example, uh, that's going to be a sponsored video. And it basically putting it in that, that upper third in, the, in that sort of quadrant where f people first see the list uh, boosts its opportunity of, of the public um, seeing it quite a, quite a bit. And uh, YouTube actually has some pretty good opportunities to, uh, to geo-target um, that they're rolling out with next year. So if, uh, I, I would actually encourage everyone to kind of wait. It's in something called beta, which means it's only open to a select pool of users, but it's going to be through something called Google AdWords, uh, which actually lets you get down um, to a pretty specific geography. Uh, I know that sounds all pretty, pretty heady and, and hard to do, but um, a, we will uh, actually post some uh, some links to that down the road uh, on the on the website that'll actually give everyone a, a better chance to uh, to use that. Uh, another question is: We had some nasty comments posted. Is it wise to not allow comments? You know, that's a great question uh, regarding regarding YouTube. And here's my feeling on that: um, YouTube is a social network, just like Facebook or just like Twitter. It's really a, a community where there's an open exchange of ideas. At the same time, though, obviously there are reputational threats or even just obscenities and things like that that you do not want appearing on your YouTube page. Uh, what you can actually do in YouTube is set up your comments to uh, to actually be approved first, uh, which allows you to basically vet each comment as it comes through before it gets posted on the public profile. So it just gets queued up into sort of a, um, a waiting line of comments as they come through. And then you can basically pick which ones you want to delete and which ones you want to post. Uh, and that's, I think, the best way to really responsibly use the tool because you definitely want good comments to come through and you don't want to block people from giving you good feedback. Another great thing about YouTube 
uh, and, and other, other video sites is that it actually gives you a chance to, um, to really get feedback on your video. Obviously, like you can use those those insights and backend analytics that I talked about, and, and we'll we'll talk about in detail later in, in the presentation. But it, it's important to make sure that you know you're getting that feedback and and people kind of telling you what they like about the video, or even maybe you know things you can change about the video. That's going to come up from time to time, and that's going to be helpful in your production. Uh, so I would yeah again advise everyone to to just vet their comments and moderate their comments. But there's a native tool in YouTube uh, that allows you to do that. Okay. So I'm going to get some more questions uh, a little bit further in the in the presentation, and again, we're going to do our very best to address all of these questions uh, both on the website and then, of course, in our one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, a little bit down the road, which again we encourage everyone to sign up for. Uh, so I think we'd left off on uh, on tagging, and I just want to elaborate on tagging a little bit more. Um, like I said, create keyword-specific file titles for your video. So, for example, um, don't just name your your file school video like I've like I've listed out here. Um, that's that's not really doing it doing it justice. You actually want to to think about the keywords, think about the content in your video. Uh, so, let's say if your video is back to school, it's themed. It's 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 about you know. Kids are coming back to school. Uh, you know, it, it's asking parents maybe to get involved in in programs that the school is doing in the fall, things like that. Um, that's that's a big thing to consider, um, and and you want that that to actually be communicated in your in your tagging. Uh, so my my suggestion is actually to, for example, in this instance, to title the file itself "Back to School," and that's actually going to pick up in uh, in search. Uh, a, a tip here also is to use the word video in your tags and titles. And this is important because a, more and more people are actually looking for video content specifically online. They, they don't want to read reams and reams of text on a web page when more and more content marketers and content, communi content communicators are actually just doing this via video, which helps them to break down you know, big ideas into, into simple, simple narratives uh, using storytelling like we, uh, like we discussed on our, on our previous uh, webinar. And that's, um, that's important to note. So actually, if you have video, just make sure that people can identify it as video and that the web crawlers um, in these search engines can identify it as video as well. So as you can see here, I've actually put video back to school um, dot mp4 as the uh, as the file name, which is kind of optimal for just making sure that it's it's covering all your bases in terms of what it really is. Um, there's another important thing to uh, to, to note here, uh, which is actually putting these on your websites. And, and again, this is something to consider um, and maybe talk about with your webmasters back at your school. Uh, one good idea is to create a unique landing URL, so a unique landing page per video when other po whenever possible. So that means featuring one video per page. Uh, and a tip for that is to make that URL a permalink structure. Um, using your keyword in the actual URL that you want to rank for. Uh, and if you can use a permalink, that's just simply a permanent link, like it sounds, for each posting um, in the case of blogs, um, in, in a lot of cases, or some web pages. Um, not everyone's web system allows them to do that, but, but a lot of them do. Um, and again, try to follow that one video per page rule when, when creating these. It's, it's just a better way for this to pick up. And I think I have a question here. Oh, and this was actually a follow-up question to um, the paid sponsored videos. Um, and I think the question is, when you pay to sponsor a video, doesn't the site pay people to click on your site to drive up your costs? Um, no, not exactly. The, uh, the way that that works is people are basically you're paying for people to view the video or have a better likelihood of that video to show up. And what I'm speaking about specifically here is sponsored videos in YouTube. Um, just to make sure that I'm understanding the question right, I'm going to look at this. When you pay to sponsor a video, doesn't the site pay people to click on your site to drive up your costs? Um, that's not exactly it. There are content partners, for example, that actually get a, a, some sort of transaction for, for video clicks. Um, that's really not, I really was really speaking more to actual you know, paid sponsorship of video and paid promotion. Um, the uh, the what the, the site actually does it doesn't really pay people to do anything doesn't YouTube isn't paying anyone to click on the video it's just giving you an opportunity through through a paid method to basically put your video and supersede the search engine process and put your video um, basically force it into the, the the top rankings against certain search terms so people have a, a greater likelihood of clicking on it the whole idea is that YouTube is leveraging a large amount of video traffic and then the 
Uh, next question is around tagging, uh, and it is, for tagging and naming, are there any suggestions for a more general about us type of video? Uh, that's a great question. And tagging and tagging and naming obviously is, is key. If your video is general, um, I, I would challenge you to really think about what your, what your kind of elevator pitch statement in the video is uh, and any content that you're covering. So if it is just about you, I think that's, that's definitely a, a little, something that's going to get lost in translation. In, uh, in search rankings, but I would also, of course, use the name of your school uh, as key, probably the geography where you're located. That's important because that's going to index about, uh, for people who are looking for Jewish schools in your market. Um, obviously, use sort of the main uh, key identifiers, so obviously, you know, Jewish, day school, uh, and, and any other more, uh, more specific terms to your school or your programs that you're talking about in your video. Uh, and then, um, uh, beyond that, I would I would kind of cover your bases in terms of just making sure that if you see any words that are popping up, really terms or themes that are popping up in the content of your video, to, to make sure that you know you watch it a couple of times and you jot those down and include it in your tagging. Okay, so I'm going to uh, to jump into the I think our last slide on tagging and video search. Um, this is really just more for actually sharing content that actually gets you those inbound links that I was talking about. Uh, and that's actually using an embed code um, that actually allows people to grab a video. I'm just going to pick on this example here again. Um, and an embed code, I'm just going to use the YouTube example. So you can obviously share this link, you know, you can email this out to or, uh, or you know, put it on, on Facebook or whatever. But really, the, the way that uh, actual publishers um, and, and even your own webmasters at your schools are actually putting these videos, uh, at least from YouTube and, and all these other video players, on their pages is something called an embed. And this is an embed code that I'm showing you right here, that what's highlighted in blue. And this is basically just a line of code uh, that basically allows this video to pop up on another web page through something called an iframe. Um, it's basically just a portal that pulls this video out of YouTube and puts it on a website. Uh, and this is, this is pretty simple. Um, bloggers who are using sites like Blogger or WordPress basically just pull this code, drop it into um, the HTML on their, on their own blog, uh, and then that's basically one and done. They can, they can change the sizing of it, like the width and the height that you see right here. Uh, and, and a couple of the attributes around it, but it's uh, it's fairly simple, and, and it's the way that you're going to actually send this to people to uh, to include on their own sites. And just a note about that last slide, actually, um, what I like to do actually is create a content population guide. So after you've made a couple of videos, uh, maybe set up an Excel spreadsheet that has your embed code, your share code, your title of your video, your keywords. And it's a good way to, to just kind of have that um, on a sheet of paper to track down the road to see if you're, you're repeating a lot of keywords, to see if um, also to have that embed code if, let's say, you want to give it to like a blogger or a local, um, a local newspaper website or, or something like that. Um, so we're going to get into our first actual distribution channel now that we've talked about tagging and just why that's important. Uh, and that's, of course, YouTube. And uh, just a word about YouTube. YouTube is by and, by and far the largest video viewing site in the United States. I'm going to minimize my screen here. YouTube is, by and large, the largest um, video site in the United States, like I said. Um, really, 80% of the US market is, and, and, and above is actually using YouTube, and on a really regular basis. Um, I actually watched uh, a, couple of, a couple of things on YouTube this morning before I came into work today. Um, and it's, for, for marketers and for, for day schools, it's a place to upload, tag, and post your videos, like we talked about. Um, there's, there's some kind of key things that to consider on a YouTube page. And I'm going to just show you uh, a, a few things now. There's, for example, uh, playlists, which is actually, as you can see here, we've divided ours into some categories. And that's something that as you develop a library of video and actually build up this content, um, you're going to want to start thinking about how you're going to categorize that. And it makes that easier for people who come to your YouTube page. And your YouTube page is owned media. It's your own channel. So you want to make that as user friendly for people as possible. And so organizing uh, your content into these playlists um, lets, you, lets you do that better. We talked about moderation before. So for example here, we have uh, some comments on our page here, um, all of them pretty positive. Uh, these are all basically comments that I approved as our, as our um, uh, kind of our web editor for our YouTube page, uh, for example. So you can set your settings to actually to, to kind of screen out or at least hold up uh, the comments that you get so you can approve them. Um, 
Of course, you can arrange your playlists into, into different ways. So for example, I could just move things around um, pretty easily right here. I'm not going to do that um, today, but it's, it's pretty simple. But just think about the, uh, the categories of themes that your videos are covering and how you're going to organize those on your actual YouTube channel. And then as I discussed, we talked about embedding and sharing your videos, which we showed you how to do before. Um, that's something that we encourage you to do right out of YouTube since it's really one of the most simplest approaches. I'm going to make time for a question right now, really quick. Uh, so the question is, um, we use Vimeo because we feel that there is so much inappropriate content on YouTube. Uh, we felt that if we send our students to videos on YouTube, we're encouraging them to come across possible negative content. Uh, what are the thoughts? Uh, you know, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, really, it's, it's a hard one to address because Vimeo obviously has, uh, it, actually Vimeo was kind of started by a, a community of producers and it was really much more around um, kind of higher end and documentary content. Um, whereas YouTube is really much more for the masses. It was just a place, a clearinghouse for all the video on the internet. Um, and, and to your point, it is, it is frankly, um, you know, a, a gamble when you're sending, especially minors, to, to, look at, to look at content where they might be exposed to something else. Um, here's one thing that I would just consider off the top of my head, though. If you're sending people to look at day school video content, there's, I think, less of a chance that they're going to be exposed through just natural um, linking. So, for example, the, the videos that kind of pop up on the right-hand side that are related to your themes. Um, chances are aren't going to be you know something that's inappropriate right off the bat. That said, I mean they're they're kids. They're on the internet. They're naturally curious, and they're probably going to look around. So I think it's really a matter of comfort for uh, for each um, each individual group. One great way though to sort of gatekeep where they go to see that video is if you're taking that video and actually putting it on your own YouTube page, you can just direct them to inbound to your, own, to your own page or put it on your website and say, if you want to watch this particular video, you can see it here. Um, hosting on Vimeo, obviously, is, is different than YouTube. There's, there's a different audience, really, on Vimeo. Uh, we like YouTube because it's just got the lion's share of, of impressions, of, of total views of online internet viewing. Um, but, but at the same time, there are considerations to make there. So as I mentioned, YouTube accounts for over 80% of online video being watched in the US today. Uh, but there are other video sites out there, uh, and you want to maximize the reach of your videos. That Vimeo question uh, was, was very timely because that is another big video website. Uh, and there are tons of other ones out there um, that we'll, we'll get into. But the thing is, to actually distribute your video on all these myriad sites, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. You have to set up these accounts. You have to you have to actively manage these pages. Uh, you have to maybe change your codec. Um, and I don't know if we got to that in the production uh, webinars, but, but that's basically the file type for your video. Uh, and, and do all this all this legwork um, to, to, to really distribute these to all these other programs. And that's pretty onerous for, for everybody. It's a lot of work, and, and nobody really has that kind of time. Uh, so we've identified a tool that we actually think is pretty amazing. Um, and that allows us to customize and tag all these videos and then spider them out to a whole network of, uh, of, other, um, of other video sites. Uh, some of which I've noted here, uh, like Dailymotion. Um, uh, it actually syncs up with YouTube itself. Uh, Vio, Vimeo, Brightcove, Metacafe, Blip TV. Um, which are all sort of the other players in the in the video landscape and and these are important to consider because some people just aren't YouTube people the majority of people are but some folks um, to, to the point of that question before do prefer Vimeo or some people do prefer Vio or Brightcove um, so the system that we're, we're going to talk about is from a company called tube mogul um, and the actual tool itself is called tube mogul one load and I just want to get it out of the way because it sounds expensive but it's not uh, it's free and frankly it's pretty easy to use um, in the long run it's gonna save you hours of work and it's gonna multiply your reach immensely basically tube mogul allows day school video producers to take that video and put it on YouTube and then put it on everything else. And that's, um, I think that's really important. It maximizes your reach. It gives you the most possible um, impressions really in an immense way. So let me get into the specifics of, of TubeMogul and then I'm actually gonna log into TubeMogul and show you um, just kind of what it looks like on the back end of it. Um, you have to f create a free one load account, um, which takes uh, a couple of seconds. Um, one time only, you need to decide which sites that are supported by TubeMogul and on their, on their website as you log in, it'll give you a list of options of sites that you can, of video sites 
that you can upload to, and you need to create quickly accounts on all of those video websites. It takes uh, took me about 45 minutes um, the first time I did it. Uh, and then save your login info on a spreadsheet. I think that's very important. Just make sure that you have that. Um, I, I encourage everyone, like I said before, to just create kind of a video file so you have an actual paper document telling you where all of your video content lives. Uh, and then you access, access one load, you just log in, you um, and enter the logins and passwords for all of the sites that you want to send your videos to. And that gives you something called a site token. Uh, and a site token basically just links up TubeMogul to that account. And it's super, super simple to do in TubeMogul. Just click the links and follow the prompts that TubeMogul gives you. And then you can tag each video, um, starting with the most important tags first. This is an important part of tagging structure uh, for TubeMogul or really anything else. Uh, and note that each website allows you a different number of tags. So I've actually logged in for a client of ours. Um, and I'm going to say, this is a back to school video. Um, again, don't use these kind of titles or descriptions. Um, I'm for the sake of time, I'm just rushing through this. But video about back to school issues, which is our simple description. Obviously, you can you can add more characters, and this even gives you the character count uh, of all of these. And this actually aggregates the tagging. So here's an important thing to consider: YouTube allows you, I think, 14 tags. Uh, whereas Bright Cove, which is another um, pretty popular video website, allows, I think, only four or something like that. Um, all of these that you see here have a different amount of tags that it allows you to, to enter. And as we talked about, tagging is important. So I'm going to talk about back to school, fall, day schools, for example. And as you can see, that's just maxing out the tags in each of these sites. So as you can see here, there are different numbers that are allowed as you go. And TubeMogul actually lets you, you fill in all of these. So that's an important thing to consider when using TubeMogul, is just that you're thinking about the, the most, important, um, most important tags first. Uh, and listing those in order. Uh, and then obviously after that, I'm not gonna upload this, um, but it's uh, basically that just uploads uh, and then it's gonna spider it out to all of those different, um, different accounts. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic tool. It's one that we like and there's some pretty cool stuff that it allows you to do in terms of tracking those videos in the aggregate on all those, all those different websites outside of YouTube. And so that actually gets us into analytics. Um, and actually, briefly, before I jump into that, I'm going to go ahead and field um, any other questions on TubeMogul, if we have any, or any for, the, uh, any for the YouTube stuff that we discovered earlier. Uh, I have a great question here. Is there a way to upload and send video without making it public or for our private audience only? And the answer to that, uh, at least in terms of YouTube, is yes. And I'm going to go back actually to our, the back end of our page. And I'm going to actually quickly, to, even, to demonstrate that even better, I'm going to do an upload in YouTube. And this might take just a second, but I think it's worth the time. Just to show you how this works. And while that's loading, I'm going to answer that question. So there are three basic privacy settings on YouTube. And one is public. That's anyone online can search for and, and view the, the video. And YouTube recommends that because obviously YouTube wants the most traffic, the most viewing, the most interaction. Uh, but for people who want to use their, their YouTube channel in a more private and more discreet way, there's two other options here uh, that, that deliver on that question. There's unlisted. Uh, which means anyone with the link can actually view the video. So you actually need the, the link. And each video in YouTube gets a personalized link. Uh, they're all unique, like snowflakes. Um, and then the next option is private viewing. And that means only specific YouTube videos viewers can view, which are defined uh, by the user. Uh, there's also another important thing to consider here, which is um, licensure. Uh, there's a standard YouTube license, and this is basically, uh, basically who gets to share these videos. Um, 
there's the standard YouTube license and the Creative Commons license. Um, as you can see here, the user grants basically permission um, for, the, uh, for the content to be passed on by other people. And then this is the Creative Commons license, uh, which actually means that people can actually take content from your video and, uh, and use it in, um, in other work, um, which is completely the prerogative of the organization that's publishing that to do. Um, and again, like, just like we saw in TubeMogul, there are tagging structures and, uh, and descriptions that we need to consider in YouTube as well. And I would recommend to, again, consider actually using the, uh, the most important tags first. And do we have any questions about TubeMogul before we move on? I have a, a question, actually, that stumped me. Um, any thoughts on SchoolTube? And uh, to tell you the truth, I am not familiar with SchoolTube, but I'll tell you what, we will check that out, um, give, a, give our opinion on it, and um, identify any opportunities for the folks on this call, and we will, uh, we will post that as a follow-up um, in, uh, in the resources section on the website. And then uh, another great question here. Do you have to have accounts on all the tube mobile sites that it serves? Or you can just do a few. You can do as many as you want or as few as you want. Uh, and that's, that's important for some people because, frankly, some of the channels that, that tube mobile supports are going to be less relevant for the people on this call. Um, for example, there's one that's like a cooking video website, another one that's like a race car video website uh, that, are, that are supported sites that frankly are a little bit, a little bit less important um, and, and obviously not as contextually relevant. So yes, uh, you, can, you can only pick, let's say, if you only want to publish on Vimeo and, and Metacafe or even just one of those two, uh, you can absolutely do that through TubeMogul uh, and you can add sites as you go. So I'm going to jump back into our presentation, um, and that's actually about analytics. And we, we talked about insights and analytics earlier, and that's just basically, like I said, a big fancy word for uh, online reporting. And YouTube and TubeMogul all have dashboards, which is basically just a, a big readout that gives you uh, all the information you need to really learn from your videos. In insights and analytics, they allow you to see who's watching and from where, like I mentioned earlier. And it's just, a, like I said, a great way to get a read on your viewing audience and track if the right people are viewing. Um, you can really interpret these, and they sort of tell a story. Um, right off the dashboard, you can even export reports and, and play with that data in, like, let's say, Excel or a CSV. Um, really quickly, I'm going to look at uh, YouTube Insights, actually, and kind of show you what that looks like. Um, I'm not going to dive too deep into this today because, A, um, there's a lot to show in the Insights dashboard, and, B, there's... Uh, frankly, it's this is just the kind of things that you'll really get. It's very intuitive, and you'll get it when you actually play around with it in person um, with, with a few minutes to spare. Uh, but at, the, at its most basic, it gives you a, a read of basically your demos. So for example, C3's, uh, C3's channel, our YouTube channel, in the aggregate, 58% um, of our viewers are female, 42% are male. And this actually gives us an age breakdown of who's watching, of who's watching what. So, for example, if you're sending out, um, and you can actually drill down to specific videos as well, um, if you're targeting a video against grandparents or uh, older alums, for example, you can actually go back and look and see who viewed that video based on demos uh, to actually get a better idea of whether or not it was inside your, your, your target demo that you were going after, uh, which allows you to sort of refine and, and see if you can get, make your targeting a little bit sharper. Uh, this just shows views. We can actually show there's something, there's something new called YouTube Discovery. Um, this looks quite scary, but it's really not. It's basically just a, uh, a way to see um, the links that were, that were actually followed from the video. Um, like we showed before, there was demographics. Um, there's things like geography that you can actually look into. Uh, and then uh, a, few other, a, a few other points that I will um, I, I really strongly encourage everyone to check out and take a look at at their, uh, at their leisure and, um, and after the, the presentation. Uh, TubeMogul has a very similar dashboard that actually aggregates all of the other websites that it supports. Uh, so again, not to, not to harp on analytics, but I would encourage everyone to really take advantage of that as a way to really keep an eye on how your video is doing, and that's going to that's gonna help you kind of optimize your distribution channels. And so the next piece that we're going to get into, um, you know, we talked about TubeMogul and we talked about um, the, the, the ways to actually put this on YouTube. And those are channels that you own. That's what we call owned media. Um, that's things like your website. It's things like YouTube and TubeMogul that, are, that you have the, the control of. Um, I want to talk about earned media and, and sort of um, chaperoned media are, are ways to call it. And that's, that's channels that you own. 
but you're also really using to broadcast uh, and actually in a more in a more interactive way. Uh, and that, that also includes blogs. That includes really press that actually uh, online press, for example, in your in your community that might pick up your video uh, and get you quite a bit of impressions and quite a bit of publicity through it. So uh, I'm going to start with social networks. Um, uh, I think we had a poll going, um, or are going to get one going to see who is uh, who is on some certain social networks. Uh, we'd love your feedback on that. That's going to help us um, really refine and going into our, our one-on-one consultations, um, really let us address this issue because we see this, especially for locally oriented organizations like these day schools, the, the one of the best places to actually build a community online and then provide them with the video that's doing your storytelling for you. Uh, and that's your Facebook audience, your, your Twitter audience, um, and your YouTube audience. Remember, YouTube is also, in, in its own right, a social network. Uh, they're most likely comprised of local individuals who have interest in your school for various reasons. So, you know, people in your Facebook group might be or rather in your Facebook audience, might be parents, uh, grandparents, alumni, and more. And social networks like these are really a crucial first step in broadcasting your videos online. Um, to distribute these videos, it can be as simple as just posting them to your, um, you know, posting them to your Facebook newsfeed, or, um, or actually, you know, you can upload these videos onto Facebook, which is something I recommend everyone does. Twitter video uh, is a simple way to get to get that video file out there. You just basically add the link and you send it out. Um, it's a great way to do a, a couple of things. Um, And before I get into kind of the uses of that, I want to talk about also just the general use of video because uh, unfortunately I see a lot of organizations, especially small nonprofits and educators and schools, they make a video and they they post it out in all these other ways that we talked about, but really your social media audience, generally speaking at a local level, is a slam dunk for, for seeing this video content. But remember, in the social media space, there there's really a, a, a very very limited cycle. There's a lot of content that's sort of flowing through. For example, a Facebook newsfeed. Um, some of you who have larger um, Facebook or Twitter followings, you could log in right now and just see that ticker. You know, take a story from the top and move it to the bottom in the time that it takes for us to to finish this phone call. So. Consider using your your content more than once. Um, you know, you you want to make sure that you're really saturating, uh, obviously without annoying anyone, but actually, you know, retreading that video and reframing it and recontextualizing it when you post it more than once. So don't just post the video and, and walk away. Uh, give people an idea and a call to action in your posts of why they should see it. Tell them, hey, check out our new video about back to school. Learn how you can get involved with our our you know fall programs this year, for example. And then if there's another piece of of content or or thematic material in that video that you can address, uh, speak to that in a separate post. Um, If there's another part about, let's say, like sports season starting in the fall as part of, you know, the overall back to school theme, you can talk to that in that context um, down the road and use that post again on your social media channels the following week. So it's just a a great way to get the the, the most leverage out of that. And then, like I said, uh, especially on Facebook, if you're active on Facebook and your school is active on Facebook, upload that video um, to the the page uh, and and it'll actually come through on on a video tab that people can watch. It just gives another destination for people to watch your video on your channel. I'm gonna stop really quickly for a question. Uh, and this is, is there an optimal time to post when people are most likely to be checking their newsfeed? Uh, you know, that's actually a great question, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of data, um, much of it conflicting on that. Um, I would say my rules of thumb, just in terms of uh, how I organize you know, social media marketing, is to, uh, to consider your target and consider the people that you're trying to get in front of. So, for example, if you're, if you're really looking to ac- activate um, parents, for example, who you know are, are working during the day, uh, you might actually want to try to, to get them, um, and, if, and if you're scheduling posts through things like Hootsuite or something like that, you might actually want to schedule those posts for in the morning or in the, uh, in the evening after they've picked up the kids or on the weekends. Um, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule to it, and Facebook actually has an insights back end similar to what I showed you for YouTube that shows you when people are viewing your posts. Um, again, there's no hard and fast rule, but I would say uh, just keep your keep your audience in mind and 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 keep the uh, keep the the sort of intuitive habits of the people who are going to view that material in mind when you're posting. But uh, generally speaking, I'd say it's not necessarily a hard and fast rule. And again, if people are sort of subscribing to you on Facebook, that's going to be top content in their news feeds, and it's going to be a little stickier, uh, especially since Facebook's rolled out sort of a new um, a new system for basically identifying which stories, as they call them, uh, which are just posts on profiles, are, uh, are the most important. And there's another question about TubeMogul. Um, would TubeMogul put it on Facebook for you? Yes, it does, actually. TubeMogul does support Facebook. Um, 
uh, actually just these are this visual that I showed here is actually just uh, a handful of the sites, but really the biggest ones that TubeMogul supports. Um, you can post directly to Facebook and Twitter. Um, here's the rub: I actually don't recommend um, doing this though, and that's for uh, that's really for a couple of reasons. Um, most specifically, like it, TubeMogul doesn't really give you the opportunity to uh, to really frame the context of the video and actually add comments. Um, the Facebook video uploader is actually really, really simple uh, to use. And, and you can actually, in the time it takes to, to upload to TubeMogul, and actually I would agree this to this for YouTube as well, uh, since YouTube it just gets so much more traffic and Facebook gets so much more traffic, I would actually set those aside. And if you can find the time, um, and it's really not a ton of time extra, uh, upload directly to YouTube and directly to Facebook. Um, outside of TubeMogul, because that actually allows you to use some of the things that get lost in translation in the transfer on, on YouTube, um, like the tagging, the extra tags that it gives you, uh, and actually adding descriptions and organizing that into playlists on your, on your channel uh, a little bit more effectively. Uh, and then with Facebook as well, the Facebook video uploader takes just seconds. Um, you actually get a kind of a quality boost uh, from the, the native video player in Facebook, and uh, I, would, I would consider doing that, because you can also add comments and, and really contextualize uh, and add a caption to, to the video itself. And then the, uh, the final question is, how do you tag video on Facebook? And that's really actually a great question. Um, in Facebook, you, you really don't tag video like you do with other sites. With Facebook, uh, you, you get a title, you get a quick caption, but that's less of, um, less of a search feature because Facebook isn't about searching for content as much as it is about searching for people and organizations. Uh, and the way that Facebook search works is really more about finding a specific profile. Uh, than a specific sort of piece of micro content, which is a video. So the theory here is that people are going to look for uh, your organization or, or you know, the people that are friends with you on Facebook and they're going to go back and check out what you're doing on your Facebook wall. And then they're going to click through to that video tab and actually view your video. Um, much more so than actually using Facebook versus, let's say, Google or YouTube to search for your video. That's, that's kind of a user habit issue. And so... Um, just to just to recap, um, with your with your social media distribution, I mean, leverage this. Use your video content more than once. Um, reuse it, recontextualize it, reframe it uh, for multiple posts. Really get get the most out of it. Obviously, you don't have to do that every single day. We don't, you don't need to be posting the same video for a week. Um, you know, each each success success day, but um, but over over a couple of weeks, over a month, over over however long, uh, reintroduce that video. It's good content. Video that appears on Facebook posts is actually um, you know more more likely to be viewed and more likely to actually boost your your opportunity for actually being sort of primary content on people on, on your constituents um, Facebook walls or Facebook news feeds rather. Um, and my next question here, or rather my next, uh, my next statement, and then I'll get to questions about um, social media and blogging, uh, is uh, using uh, actual Facebook really quickly to, to create video playlists on your, on your school's profile. Um, we, we talked about doing that. There are a couple different ways to do it. Um, I would start by actually uploading directly to Facebook, and it will give you basically just a, a videos section on your profile. Uh, you can also create a, uh, a free YouTube tab using a, an application called Involver, although that's something that is for the more advanced people in the room and might need to, uh, and that actually links you to, uh, links your Facebook page to your YouTube page. Um, but I would, I would caution that that's something that folks as webmasters might need to do because it requires a little bit of light um, work with code. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to get to bloggers. And you know, we talked about owned media. We talked about earned media. Um, Facebook and Twitter, obviously, are sort of in between. But in terms of earned media, bloggers and really publishers, these are the influentials online in your, in your neighborhood, in your, in your community, uh, that you actually want to create some relationships with. Um, if you haven't built a blogger or online press list, uh, I encourage you to start. It's a great resource for community building and disseminating information. And I think video, if that's the, the impetus for you to start that process, I think that's great. Even if you're, you're building these relationships with local influentials just for the first purpose, of sending them some video, which is content that's kind of rich and that local influencers really want to get instead of just, you know, some text, um, I, I would encourage you to start. But I mean, the, the long-term benefit of having that, that organized list of, of online influentials is that you know, for example, when you have a new video or when you have something to say, you know who to say it to and who to get that out to. Um, so I can't stress that enough. Um, I think it's especially really valuable in the local sense where, where there are people out there who are, who are publishing 
blogs, um, even reporters who are who are kind of duplicating their their press work online, um, who can who can really talk about your work, um, and even parents um, who are who are interested that might maintain um, some level of influence via a blog or a website online. Um, so definitely, if you can, um, ask them to post your post your work and, and, and send that out on their own social networks. Um, so I'm going to follow up with some really quick questions and then kind of leave off uh, and, and open up for, for some more questions. Just really quickly before we, uh, before we get into that, though, uh, I want to remind everyone to, to check out the dayschoolvideoacademy.org website um, where you can, again, sign up for free one-on-one -on -one consultations about any of the topics that we've covered in our four webinars uh, through our program so far. Uh, and learn uh, about the $50,000 of awards and incentive prizes that we'll be giving away during our video contest. And we can't stress how excited we are uh, for, the, for the video contest to commence and to see what kind of, um, what kind of work um, everyone's going to submit. Um, we know it's all going to be great, and we, uh, we're really looking forward to that. Um, in the meantime, we've sent out a poll uh, for you to tell us what type of free consultations you're going to be signing up for. Uh, this is actually probably the most helpful poll question for us today, and we'd love your feedback on that so we can, we can get ourselves prepared and make sure that we have all of our ducks in a row to answer your questions thoughtfully and make sure that we can uh, be proactive in reaching out beforehand to, uh, to put together some, some preliminary questions to sort of get to know you specifically and learn a little bit more about your specific, uh, your specific mission and the sort of the personality and the goals of uh, your individual school. But while everyone is, uh, is filling out that poll um, diligently and thoughtfully, I will, uh, I will jump into some questions here. Um, and I'm going to start with this question, which is about TweetDeck. The uh, question is, we love TweetDeck because it posts our videos to both Twitter and Facebook at one time. Uh, I love TweetDeck too. I think it's actually it's, it's a really fantastic tool. It's um, cheap, if not free, uh, and it's, it's simple to use. I would actually recommend uh, to everyone on the call that they explore using uh, TweetDeck, Hootsuite, some similar tools like that, that I think at the, at the upwards cost um, you know, a, a subscription of, let's say, $50 a month, and at the downwards are free, uh, depending on the capabilities uh, you get with your, with your subscription to it. Um, but at, at, at its basic, yeah, I would, I would love for everyone to use TweetDeck. TweetDeck is basically does the same sort of thing that TubeMogul does, but for, um, but for social networks and not just for video. You can schedule posts and, um, and schedule, um, uh, obviously, text-based and photo-based posts, not just video, into your, into your social media streams. Oh, and another thing about just posting for social media um, that I wanted to consider is that Facebook has actually really launched a sort of a new algorithm, um, a, a, basically a new equation that uh, the capricious minds at Facebook, you know, the, the hamsters that are turning the wheels that make the machine, machinery run, um, decides what picks out or what gets picked out as the best possible content to put on a news feed. And one way to sort of boost your score there is when you post a video, ask people to subscribe um, and, and ask them to also make it top content. Add a, add a overlay a call to action into the text around your video. So when you post the link to the video, ask people, hey, view our video and tell us that you like it by um, putting this in your top content. And then ask people also to subscribe to your organization. Ask them to, to send it out, to spread the word. And, and that's, that's important to make your video sort of what we like to call micro-viral inside of, kind of these closed communities of, of people, these limited universes of people that, that are inside any given you know, lo local market or community that are interested in, in Jewish day schools and, and local Jewish educational issues. Um, that's, that's generally a pretty tightly knit circle. And social media is a great way to make sure that you're, you're connecting with, with the lion's share of those people by asking uh, your immediate um, followers on Facebook and Twitter, for example, to, to reshare um, with their own networks who are likely to have um, overlapping interests and, and um, curiosities about these issues. Um, my next question is, uh, I would still be very interested in some thoughts on policies related to posting videos of minors online and both ways to protect children um, and schools. This appears to be a major concern raised by parents who feel that technology and media are moving faster than our thinking about these issues. That's a really thoughtful question and, um, and definitely something to, to consider. Um, in terms of using minors in videos, um, I, I would... Not, before I defer to my colleagues and say that that's more of a production question, I would say that obviously there's, there's legal considerations, there's privacy and responsibility considerations um, at stake there. Uh, if you 
if you feel that that is a, a, a major issue for you and, and one that's just not, it's, it's not uh, a river you just want to cross yet, um, I would consider making your, making your content private on your channel and then distributing the links actually to your YouTube channel or to that specific video using the, the process that I demonstrated for you guys um, earlier, in the, uh, earlier in the webinar on YouTube to, to uh, for example, make that more closed and more um, uh, basically private um, inside your community. Uh, if you feel like there's um, issues with you actually driving people to to go to YouTube and go online when there's potentially exposure to less than savory content that they could find on YouTube, um, I would also consider you know really really just giving people a very narrow path, more narrow path uh, to follow and actually go you know straight to your YouTube channel or even embed it on your website and and maybe even set up a media page on your website where you can say, here are all of our videos. Um, and then you can also you know, embed videos from other organizations that you think are good. And you can really curate the content in that case. And you can create more of a safe space um, for, for minors especially to go on, on your school's website, for example, to see videos that you want them to see without actually steering them in the direction where they might you know, obviously stumble upon something else. Uh, so I think we are going to go ahead and wrap up today. Um, again, thanks everyone so much for joining our call today. Um, we had a few questions that we did not get a chance to answer, and we recognize that, and we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we um, do our best to post those on the website. If you don't see them there, again, I, I really strongly encourage everyone to sign up for the consultation uh, and, and learn kind of firsthand uh, by, through interacting with me and interacting with our, our producers and editors and, and storytelling professionals here at C3, uh, how your particular school can really customize your video work to fit your goals. And, uh, and we're really looking forward to having those calls. Uh, and we, uh, we hope everyone can, can join us for those. Um, so again, thank you everyone for, for joining up. We will be uh, posting a recording of this call on the, uh, on the website as well if you want to review. And we, will, uh, we look forward to talking to you all very soon.